Aloha and welcome back to Physical Therapy for a Better Life. I'm your host, Christine Linders, physical therapist and board certified orthopedic clinical specialist. Today, let's get to know our pelvic floor ladies. Whether you're a young athlete, a new mom who has just given birth, or a woman of retirement age, you want to learn right now how to keep your pelvic floor muscles functioning well or tune them up to prevent leakage, pain, prolapse, and more. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Pauline Lucas, who is a physical therapist and board certified in women's health to teach us how. Aloha and welcome back, Pauline. Hey, Christine. I'm so glad to be here with you again. I am so, so, so grateful. You have so many different talents from mindfulness, health coaching, women's health. Amazing. I'm so inspired. I I can't wait for this show. So I'm going to drop a big question so everyone knows what we're going to talk about. And that is, what is the pelvic floor? How can we use it or how does it relate to leakage? And should we be kegeling or not? <laughs> That's the question, right? And um, wow. Well, again, thank you for having me on your show. It's really fun. And I love teaching women about their pelvic floor. Men too, but I'm I'm only treating women with pelvic floor issues and um, it is so important and it is not talked about, although I have seen, so I've been doing this for 20 something years now and I have seen a change and that is because of social media. And I would say, especially over the last two years or so, my patients come in and they sit, tell me that they've requested to come go to a physical therapist to help them with their pelvic floor because of something they saw on YouTube or TikTok or read on Facebook or Instagram. And uh, so the word is getting out a little more, which I think is incredible because pelvic floor problems are going to, are affecting a third or, or like even like 25% or 30 something percent of women during their lifetime. So we better talk about it, right? Yeah. And no, it's, um, it's, so, it's incredible. Yeah. And so the, the issues, I'm going to give a little anatomy lesson in a little bit. I brought my model so I can actually show what the pelvic floor is. Um, but pelvic floor dysfunction can result in things like bladder incontinence or even having a difficult time urinating, um, like, you know, not having a good urine stream. Um, it could be constipation. It can be pain. It can be sexual pain. So there's a lot of different things that, that can actually be related, a lot of dysfunction that can be related to pelvic floor problems. So let's start at the beginning. What is the pelvic floor? And I have to tell you, when I went to physical therapy school in the Netherlands, we talked in detail about the abdominal wall, every bit I knew it all. And then there was a mention about this pelvic floor, and then we went right on to the hip. So I pretty much didn't know anything about it until I was pregnant and I started having problems with my pelvis, pelvic pain. And so that's when I started really learning about this pelvic floor, this, this secret pelvic floor. And uh, since then, it has been my mission to educate as many women as possible about their pelvic floor. And men have a pelvic floor too. Let's, let's you know, make sure that we address that. But I'm going to focus on female pelvic floor disorders there is some overlap. So if men are listening, you can absolutely keep listening because you'll learn something too. Um, but here's a pelvic, a pelvis, a female pelvis. So we do not have these screws. Just thought I'd point that out. So, so this is a female pelvis, like the way I'm sitting right now. And this here, this bone right here, if you put your hand on your hip, then you feel that bone on the top, right? If you have your hands on your hips. So this is called your iliac crest, and you have them on each side. This here is the pubic bone. And the pubic bone is really, if you're having your fingers on your belly, and when I'm with patients, this is what we do. We have an anatomy lesson, and I have them push into their belly, and it's soft, 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 and then they go down until they hit that bone. Okay, now I'm going to tilt this pelvis so you can actually see the pelvic floor in more detail. So here is the, are the sit bones. And what I tell my patients to do is lift one of your cheeks and put your hand underneath and sit on your hand and you feel a big bone sitting right in, in your hand. And when you put your fingertips around there, your fingertips are on your pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor starts here at that pubic area 
and then goes all the way to the sit bones and then all the way back to the tailbone. So now this person will be doing a headstand, which is the back side, but here's the tailbone. So I can also show it to you this way, like that. So this is the backside. And so here's the tailbone and the pelvic floor also attaches to that tailbone. So really it's the whole bottom of the pelvis that is covered with the pelvic floor. Now, the pelvic floor is a collection of muscles and connective tissue, and they form the foundation, the base of, of the pelvis. Now, you may have seen when you're looking here that there's three openings. So that's where, of course, the anatomy differs from the males. And so the urethra is on the front here, right behind that pubic bone. Yeah. Vagina is right there. And then the anus is right here. And we see that there's a superficial layer of muscles and connective tissue right here. At and then a deeper layer. Mm -hmm. This deeper layer in the medical terminology, we call it the levator ani, which kind of means lifting of the anus, the lifter of the anus. And in the more popular terminology, it's often referred to as the PC muscle, which is really only one part of the levator ani, but that's often what I see on popular media. And now if you look at it from the top into it, you can see it here. So this whole like sling of muscles almost, right? So these muscles, I'm going to continue the anatomy lesson, if that's okay. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So sure these muscles have... Learning yeah. so much right now. So these muscles have a couple of very important jobs. Number one, to keep your female organs on the inside. Mm -hmm. Very important, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, number two, to keep us continent. So that's going to be leading into your next question, right? Yes. And so... Um, and then the other thing is it plays a role with our sexual function. And, and this is really important for the athletes too, it also plays a role with our core stability. So, you know, a lot of people talk about strengthening their core and then they talk about their abdominal muscles mostly, but yes. the core is also the back muscles, the hip muscles, and also the pelvic floor. Yeah, the core is quite extensive. And it's funny you mentioned how the functions of the pelvic floor are to keep our organs inside, right? They aid in sexual function and also a part of stability. And I remember that I was in Connecticut at a sports clinic and I was teaching people pelvic floor exercises for various things. And I remember when I was having an issue in my, I think it was my early thirties, it was sports incontinence. I would, if I had to if I had to urinate and I was playing volleyball and I jumped from a landing, I would leak. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Especially if I was menstruating at the time, that's usually when it would happen. I felt like everything was maybe weak at that one time a month and I would leak. And I, I didn't know I had a tailbone injury in snowboarding and I kind of connected it to that, but I like you didn't learn about the pelvic floor in PT school. So I went to my OBGYN and she was asking if you had any other questions. And I said, actually, yeah, I'm having, having this problem. And you know, I don't, I don't ask anybody else, but she checked me and said, oh, yours is strong, but maybe you don't have the endurance during that time of month. And she said, just do 20 Kegels a day. So 20 years later, I kind of coined the phrase with my patients, 20 Kegels a day takes all your problems away. <laughs> the sexual function helps with incontinence, keeps your organs inside and works it with your core to give you stability. So I just remember that when you were throwing out all those amazing functions of the pelvic floor. <laughs> yeah, so what a great physician to give you that information, right? Amazing, I'll never forget her, I'll never forget her. That was yeah. my first interest in doing pelvic floor exercises. And then, you know, I'm craving so much more knowledge, so thank you. Mm, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, so it's interesting, right, with athletes, because often athletes are very strong, but then they have incontinence. And I mean, sometimes when you go on YouTube, you can see crossfitters or, you know, people that lift extremely heavy and they're losing urine and um, or in gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And it's not, and, you know, these are strong women. What can happen is really that the abdominal wall can be very strong and tight and actually putting excessive uh, pressures on the pelvic floor. That can be one thing. And the other thing can be that there's just an imbalance between the abdominal wall and the, and the bladder or the pelvic floor. And yeah, pelvic floor strength training is part of it. But what is actually really interesting too is that sometimes those muscles are too tight. So the pelvic floor muscles can be too weak, but they can also be too tight. And when they're really tight, it can also result in weakness. 
So a lot of times I have to actually first work with my patients on relaxing the pelvic muscles and uh, lengthening the pelvic muscles. And then we work with strength training. That's amazing. And, that, uh -huh. and often other symptoms that go hand in hand with a pelvic floor that's too tight is painful, you know, pain conditions, like pain in the, in the vaginal area, uh, sometimes constipation because those muscles, if they don't relax well, it's hard to have a bowel movement. Um, sometimes it's your, you know, urination, that, uh, uh, urine stream that's hard to initiate. Um, sometimes urgency, like the bladder is all of a sudden it's like, oh, I just have to go. And, and, you know, we have to run to the bathroom to try and make it. And then sometimes painful intercourse can be related to that as well. And yeah, yeah. So that's where you went when you said, do we do kegels or not? What well, kind of depends, right? It does. And, and how can you like, I know you can tell in the clinic if you're seeing someone, but how could you tell whether someone's, let's say, a leakage, for example, or urgency, they can't make it and they're just like, I have to go and they can't make it to the bathroom. Like, how can you tell if that pelvic floor is something that's too, too tight and that's why it's giving them that problem or it needs to be tightened? Because that's a big differentiation. And the only way that you can truly figure that out is by having somebody examine you. Okay. You know, and really, I would say typically physical therapists are the ones to go to a pelvic yeah. floor physical therapist, because not every physical therapist will do internal examinations. You know, we have to do training to do this. Um, yeah, like in a case like yours, for example, I would actually guess, you know, with being an athlete and working out a lot, I would probably have expected that there may have been some tension there. It kind of depends on how much tension and how much of a problem that is. Sometimes doing kegels, and if you do them correctly, which is also an issue, not a lot, a lot of my patients have done kegels and they actually didn't do them correct. Um, but sometimes if, if there is some tightness and weakness, sometimes doing kegel exercises can actually be beneficial and takes care of both. But sometimes you can really create a pain condition if you're just doing too much of these strengthening exercises when it's already tight. So... If you want to know 100% sure, I'd say go see a physical therapist. If you're like, kind of like you and you're like, hey, I'm going to just try this out. Hey, if it helps your symptoms, you did the right thing. If you're getting more, if you had pain already, probably if you had pain already, I would go see somebody first. But let's say uh, you're doing these exercises, but your problem is only getting worse. Yeah. Probably also time to go see somebody. But if you're like, yeah, I'm having a little bit of leaking. I'm going to try some of these exercises and you really read the instructions and you feel like you can do it, do them maybe for a month or two months. And if you feel it's improving, hey, that's it. That was your solution. And if not, I would go see somebody. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great recommendation. So now the burning question is, um, how do you do them correctly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is actually, it is a bit of a trick, right? Um, so when I teach it to somebody, I always check. So for me yeah. to just tell you how to do them is actually yeah. kind of hard, but I'm going to do my best. So sometimes I suggest go to the bathroom, you know, urinate. Can you stop the flow of urine? That could be one trick. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're like, yep, I can do it. Then I say, well, what did it take? For, what did you have to do in order to make that happen? And most likely you were doing a bit of a pelvic muscle contraction at that point, right? Yeah. The other thing I sometimes say is pretend you're about to pass gas and it's not a good, good moment. <laughs> what do you do? Sometimes it works to tell people that, but sometimes they just start squeezing their glutes together. Yeah. And if you do that in sitting, your body goes up and down. So if, you, if I say, yes, exactly what you're doing there. <laughs> so that means you're doing glutes, right? We yeah. go up and down. So can you tighten more around the anus? Sometimes I just tell people, Tighten the muscles around the anus and around the vagina without tensing everything else around it. So not the hip muscles, you know, not your inner thighs. The abdomen will engage a little bit and, you know, see if you can hold that. Sometimes I say pretend, this is kind of a weird one, but pretend that you're um, picking something up from the floor with your vagina muscles. Oh, yeah. Like good. when you're standing, you know. So there's different ways like that. If you're very comfortable with your own body, you can insert your finger vaginally. Yep. And can you feel a squeeze around your finger when you're, when you're uh, contracting? Yeah. So those great. are some things. Or if, you know, ideally when you have your pep smear and when you have your uh, annual exams, the doctor checks it. But unfortunately, that's not 
typically the case. Yeah. Ideally, in my ideal world, the gynecologist would check, you know, or your primary care physician who does your exam. Like mine did that day when I told her I was having that problem. She goes, oh, we were just done. And uh, she said, oh, let me, let me check. She put the glove back in and she goes, squeeze. And she's like, oh, squeeze again, squeeze and hold. She's like, well, you're strong. Uh, you just might not have the endurance or whatever. I yeah. mean, this was so long ago. I can't, I just remember her checking and saying it worked and then telling me you can do these exercises to help with, with the endurance, which, um, which I know this might jump, the endurance made me think of jumping to a, a little offshoot. I've had some patients who will go to the bathroom and they wake up in the morning, they go to the bathroom and then they have to walk down the hall to go to the kitchen to take care of their pet or make their breakfast. And when they get there, they're leaking, they're like peeing. <clears throat> and so I'm not sure <clears throat> what kind of instance that is, or like maybe discussing a little bit about the normal bladder function and, and what that kind of means with pelvic floor and, and bladder. Uh, if you can explain anything about that, it just popped in my head right now. Right yeah, now. yeah, no, that's a great question uh, because we didn't really explain the whole idea of incontinence, like what actually happens. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the bladder and I'm going to use, just use my hand because I didn't have an anatomy teacher. But let's say this is my bladder. And the bladder, what you need to know about the bladder is that it's, it's like a balloon, like a, like a, a hollow muscle almost, right? Mm -hmm. And so the bladder, when it's, when it's empty, is small. There's a constant, very gradual drip from the kidneys. Like I, I compare it with an IV drip. So, you know, the, the kidneys are constantly producing um, urine. And very gradually, the bladder fills. So it is a little balloon that sits right behind that pubic bone, right behind and above. Most people will know where their bladder is because you can feel it when it's full. Yeah. And so that bladder gradually expands as it's filling. At some point when it's filling, the little sensors on the inside, the little receptors on the inside of the bladder will give a signal to the brain saying, hey, it's time to go find a bathroom, you know, and then typically we get some advanced notice, right? Like maybe 30 minutes or so, maybe a little longer. And as it fills more, the pelvic floor gets a little tighter to make sure that everything stays closed, oh. right? Um, and so for some people, that mechanism doesn't work quite right. And so they feel a little bit of expansion and immediately they feel an urge to go. And they need to run to the bathroom. And as they run, they actually leak. So that's mm -hmm. one. And that would be called urge urinary incontinence. Okay. Okay. So the one that you're talking about, let's say you wake up, you have a very full bladder, you know, it's really expand. The pelvic floor is just having to, you know, keep everything closed. And uh, there's also some muscles, some muscles right around the urethra, the pipe that goes from the bladder down out, you know, to, to urinate. So let's say that person doesn't actually go, even though she feels a really strong urge and now gets up and imagine now the pelvic floor has to work harder than when you were lying down. So if you now walk to the kitchen with that really full bladder, the, the pelvic floor better really work very hard. And so there's a good chance otherwise that you will leak urine. Nice. My advice for her would be take care of yourself first, empty your bladder before you take care of your animals. Yeah, like take some time and like breathe and relax and just really empty your bladder and sit there and let it go. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a good, uh, a good strategy for yes. sure. Yes, yeah. And some women, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, so stop me when it's too much, but some women that. need to double void. So let's say you've had a prolapse or something, which means that the organs sit a little lower in the pelvis, which can happen after childbirth or with aging. Sometimes they feel like they urinate and they're like, hey, I get up and it's like I'm leaking a little afterwards or I need to go sit down and I have to pee some more. And what do we, what do we tell them is, okay, empty your bladder without pushing. It actually needs to happen quite naturally by just relaxing those pelvic floor muscles that have kept everything closed and then the bladder squeezes the urine out that's how that works okay so the pelvic floor relaxes the bladder squeezes the urine out so we don't have to sit and push the urine out because that's dysfunctional voiding and can create problems so anyway so let's say they emptied their bladder then i suggest okay move a little bit side to side or forward and backward and then often they can they feel that they can easily release a little more urine without pushing. That's a great strategy. You know, I, I didn't even think about that. I gave this woman um, 
the strategy of like, well, why don't, you know, sometimes I think I told you in the mindfulness, sometimes in between patients, when I go to urinate, um, I will just do my mindfulness breathing. And sometimes I just bend forward and let my stomach rest on my thighs and I breathe because I'm just trying to like calm myself and do the same thing while I'm urinating. And I just told her, well, maybe hug yourself and lean forward or something just to and take some deep breaths, which probably was the wrong thing. It did work, but it might've been the wrong thing. Uh, I was just trying to have her relax and breathe and be in a different position to try to help her fully void before yeah. she got that. I like the movement better. Yeah, yeah. So it's both. I mean, I, I like your idea too. It's actually really important what you said to actually relax and take a moment. We're so rushed, you know? And so now we're trying to squeeze it urine out in 30 seconds so we can go on, do all the things that are important, but this is an important thing. So, Indeed. yes. And I see all the people, all the women that have problems with this. So, you know, be grateful that you can urinate. First of all, take the time to actually be complete. And make that a moment of mindfulness to tie it back to mindfulness, which we talked about the last time. Uh, but make this a moment you're taking care of your body. And because if you do, if you do all these things too fast and you just kind of rush through it, you can end up with problems. So take your time to empty the bladder. And uh, but here's another thing that came to mind: some women, especially in public restrooms, don't want to sit down. Yes, I and know. then. Well, think about it, how I was showing, you know, the pelvic floor relaxes while the bladder squeezes. Well, when you're in a squat, pelvic floor isn't going to fully relax, you know? So if that happens occasionally because you happen to encounter a really dirty toilet, I get it. But don't make it a habit, especially if you have to frequently be on, on a public restroom, I'd say, bring your disinfecting spray, use the seat covers do whatever you need to do so you can actually sit and that that way empty your bladder that's a that's really important i'm glad you mentioned that because i hear it from my friends more and more and more about the the hovering and i have a very hard time hovering because i feel like i can't pee all the way and and it and i also remember um and and this was just a small women's health section uh, meeting that i went to years ago and they were saying how they were doing studies of this is old like probably from 2003 or five or eight or something they were doing studies with women of different countries and pelvic floor weakness and they were saying women in asian countries that sat in the deep squat had almost no trouble with pelvic floor and one of the exercises i used to give people is to put their legs wide squat down squeeze kegel pull their tummy in and then stand up squat down squeeze pull the tummy in and stand up and exercise it that way so here we are in a in a squat that's great to exercise and already make the pelvic floor engage. And then we're trying to relax it at the same time. I remember that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good exercise. Unless people have a prolapse, then I wouldn't do that deep right. a squat. But yeah, so that's a good one. And you're right, you know, like we're doing some really strange things if you think about it. Because if you consider like your cat or your dog, that's honestly, you know, that's how we should kind of go about it too. <laughs> so until, you know, somebody invented this little porcelain potty, um, we were squatting. And that is really a much healthier way to urinate, to have a bowel movement, and of course to have babies too, really. That's, yeah. that's, that's how nature works. Uh, but we're sitting on this toilet and some people even these elevated toilets and we, we don't do our pelvic floor a favor, honestly. Yeah, you can even go um, as far as uh, getting like a squatty potty, you know, I mean, some of my patients just get a regular step stool, uh, which works too, but then I'm afraid as a physical therapist about tripping hazards. So, uh, but a squatty potty, you know, you place your hips in a better angle and it's easier to uh, allow your pelvic floor to relax. So that's another option. That's a great option. So we've learned so much. And, and now the, the next big question is, what about childbirth and how that affects the pelvic floor? I hear this from so many of my friends, my mom, everybody about different issues or uh, complications that can happen during or after childbirth. And uh, what can we do? Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, childbirth is, is a major uh, concern. Uh, it means awesome, of course. But, you know, if you think about, I, sh I just showed you this, this model. Yes. And so, you know, head of a baby coming through, 
this little area. <laughs> I mean, that, there's something about that design that, that is a bit challenging, right? <laughs> now, here's the good news when we're pregnant, there's increased flexibility. So it helps, you know, the body gets prepared for this childbirth process. But still, especially if it's a longer labor, um, if the baby's head is larger, and especially if instrumentation is being used, like vacuum or forceps or something like that, I mean, tearing can happen. And of course, a episiotomy is better than just tearing because it goes, it's angled sideways, so it doesn't go straight to the anal area. Um, but it's still, it's damage to a muscle. And sometimes there can be a bit of a nerve uh, traction injury as well. And so it's, you know, very common to have some urinary leaking right after. But what I want to emphasize to all the women that are listening is that it's not normal to then from then on have urinary leaking. And a lot of my patients think that. They tell me like, well, you know, I figured I'm a mom, so that comes with urinary leaking. You know, yeah, every, doesn't every one, woman have this when they're laughing or coughing or sneezing? And I really don't have to jump on the trampoline anymore is what they would say. Um, and I say, well, why not try and see what we can change here, right? And so that is really where a good physical therapist can, can come in and help with just strengthening exercises and addressing any scar tissue that might be there even abdominal strengthening in the right way you know drawing in like the abdominal bracing i'm sure you've talked about that at yeah. some point really important so please do not just think that because you had a baby it's normal to leak because really it's not it's common but there's something that can be done so you know, that's a really good news, I would say. That's such a big message right there. And you stated what I heard in that first women's health section meeting at, a, at the CSM conference, which was in San Diego a long time ago, which was urinary incontinence or leakage is not like a sentence that all women are just destined to get. It's not, it's not normal, but we've all said like, oh, you hear about it, you giggle about it. That's a girl thing. We're leaking. Oops, gotta pee. Oops, I laugh when I sometimes when I laugh, I pee. And it's not normal for that to happen. It's common, like you said, 25 to 33 percent of women. I've read those studies in, in 25 years and up are having incontinence issues during some form of sports, uh childbirth, all that it's so common and I talk about it and you talk about it, but in the common uh, circle, non-social media, no one's really talking about it. And it's such a, it's so um, enlightening and freeing to know that there's something you can do. There's someone you can go to for help. Like you're saying, uh, people are seeing social media and saying, oh my gosh, wait, I, I can get help with this. I love that the word is getting out there. I love that this show is going to, it touched so many people. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and it's not only about doing kegels. It has to do with also training the hip muscles and the abdominal muscles and your, you know, learning to breathe correctly. There's there's a lot to it, but just starting super simple with just some basic core strengthening, including these pelvic floor muscles. And if any doubt, really ask your doctor to refer you to a physical therapist. Um, if you know some insurance is allowed you to just go straight to the to the physical therapist without a referral, but otherwise your OBGYN or your primary care doctor. Have them refer you to a physical therapist and do an evaluation. That's great. That's right. So I think that we're kind of almost out of time. And I just want to know, uh, this has been so amazing. The education of the pelvic floor and showing the pelvis and showing us all the intricacy and of the pelvic floor and all the jobs. It's like a Pandora's box, right? We could talk for, for five weeks about this subject in and out. But is there any last words you want to share with everybody before we close um, my last words are your pelvic floor is really important and if it's not functioning right if you have painful sex if you are leaking urine you know with all these things there's help available so don't just take it for granted and don't just accept it but get help That's i've seen nice. just so many improvements in my patients and i wish that for everybody and I know that people can get in touch with you um, to talk to you about it through your website. Is that right? Yeah, actually, you know, I work for Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And so for, for the pelvic health, they can just reach out to Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Excellent. Yeah. That is excellent. So thank you so much, Dr. Pauline Lucas, for coming on and 
teaching us a wealth of information, opening Pandora's box. Um, I am so grateful to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me again. It was awesome. Excellent. Life is better when you listen to your physical therapist. Thanks, Take the Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.